The Wiggly Podcast, bringing your garden to life. Welcome, listener, to this week's special podcast. Actually, it's my favourite bits of the last year and a bit of us broadcasting to the world from the Wiggly Sofa. So I'd like to thank you for listening very much, and here they are. Enjoy. Best to report that if they found more snipe coming back in the sturts, that's good news because there weren't that many there before, perhaps because it's a bit close to the town. Oh, yeah. listener, they do go on. They're just trying to avoid the moment. Uh, they are uh, trying to avoid the hedgerow right. We don't want a row, they said. We probably agree, they said. They don't. And so, <laughs> in the red corner, we have yeah. Farmer Phil. Farmer Phil in the red corner, and in the blue corner, we have a Richard Fishbourne. Obviously, I would like to be the bird who carries around the um, round number with the sparkly swimsuit. Yeah, but I could, I could I, see you in a little <laughs> crop top. But, but I can't be that because we need an impartial commentator. So I'm going to be Ari. Right. Carpenter. OK. I think that uh, given that I've had a slight inkling as to Richard's views on the subject, he ought to be in the green corner rather than the blue one. Oh, no. very funny, yeah, yeah. very, yeah, very funny. Good, good. Yeah. The background to this is, from the environmental point of view, hedges are a wonderful wildlife habitat and have decreased in terms of acreage over the years due to farmers grubbing them out, which has affected wildlife. That's mm. the environmental point of view. From the farmer's point of view, the farmer planted the hedge in the first place, so at which point of time are you going to call conservation? It's a tool for farming, it's a boundary, it's something useful, and whether they take them in or out is their business. So, round one. Ding! Guess what sparked this discussion? We, we touched on this on our last podcast, or perhaps the podcast before, but Heather and I were, were driving over to a community farm, weren't we, in North Shropps the other day. Yeah. And to be honest, I was like, hedged out. <laughs> I'd had enough <laughs> hedge talk. <laughs> so to find, to find out that I was talking about hedges again this morning, I thought, oh, joy. But, uh, <laughs> but my feeling is that it's interesting. That a lot of organic farmers, they have their hedges, and they don't cut their hedges every year. So they don't cut them annually, they cut them every three years. The reason being, generally, is because there are various micromoths and butterflies like um, brimstone and hair streaks, for instance, that rely on the hedging plants as uh, food for their larvae. So in order for those creatures to complete their life cycles, they leave the hedges, they don't they leave them and cut them at a maximum every, every three years. So it means that there are several generations of um, micromoths and uh, butterflies, for instance, that are able to complete. I think that's a right hook for Richard. Bring it back, Farmer Phil. Well, hedges by their nature are going to be a compromise for something or other. But the view I take is that if you treat a hedge in such a way that it impairs its health as a plant, then you are compromising it as anything, whether it's a farmer's tool or a wildlife habitat, so that your management of the hedge must mean that it stays healthy. With regard to things like moss, I must admit I'd never heard of this requirement for hedges and you commented Richard the other day that they particularly like the ends of the twigs in the hedge and my comment would be well there are ends in a correctly trimmed hedge anyway and if you trim a hedge after three years growth it ruins it and it will kill it. And how, how, how then do organic farmers get away with it without killing their well, hedges? The, the trouble is that they've been told that this is what they want that, that is best for them to do. Yeah. And I think that they've been told wrongly. And if you talk to people who care about their hedges and look after them, you won't find anybody to argue with you. And the point is that the argument that's been given to us as farmers is that you should do this because it saves you money and provides more habitat. But it doesn't save us money because the hedge takes much more cutting after three years' growth and it looks as if you've shot it afterwards. And in a gardening context, if a gardener goes to prune a plant, he doesn't hack the piece off, he cuts it off with a nice clean cut. And the same goes for hedges, that if you smash the ends, disease gets in, the hedge dies. And I can show you hedges that have been smashed to death. But aren't hedges smashed to death on an annual basis? No. If you look at a correctly flail-trimmed hedge, it's only cutting one-year-old growth, so it's gradually getting bigger. You have a nice clean cut because you cut it when the stem is still sappy. The idea of cutting the hedge in the wintertime is wrong because it goes hard. 
and you'll see where the, the flail cuts it. Mm. That's an old-fashioned idea because years ago when we used to cut hedges with a cutter bar trimmer, you cut them in the winter because the cutter bar trimmer worked better and you got the time to do it. Right. Oh, there's my phone. There's your phone. <laughs> Saved by the bell. Oh, round two. <laughs> the Wiggly Podcast. Dot com wiggles. I'm very pleased with it, and I'll get Good. some for Birmingham as well. Have you Good. got any other tips? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. Um, I mean, you, you, so you obviously didn't you didn't get on well with worms then? At I did all. try it. I bought a book, and see the thing is, I also have to move my life. I'm in Bir- I'm in Birmingham Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then I'm in London Monday. But I'm in the House of Commons. Go home Monday night, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Right. So. I have to be able to keep everything going, but leave it for days. Right, right. So I don't know. I got I got a bit intimidated by the worms. The, do they, I don't suppose they use bokashi in the Houses of Parliament. Do they yet? Are they yet? Probably do, not. But no. I could make inquiries. They must have enormous quantities of waste. I'm sure they do. And even if it was just, um, you know, even if it was just used in in smallish areas, small waste containers for, for I don't know for for pickling their apple cores, for instance, for um, for for collections for um, you know community allotments, that would be you know. It'd be a start. It'd be a start, absolutely. Are there any local authorities that have taken this systematically and kind of giving every household the chance to there are. their compost collection? There are. I mean, inter- interestingly enough, I was I was going to ask you uh, what, what role you think that local authorities and government can play in, in, in encouraging people to adopt these kind of initiatives. But there's a, I know for a fact, there's a there's a, a, an organisation called the East London Community Network and they provide Bakashi to households on lots of several hundred different different uh, houses right across the right way across several different estates and uh, and they what they do is they is they give people the bakashi buckets they give people the bakashi and they put their household waste their, their green waste their organic waste in effect okay. into buckets and they put their bakashi on it sprinkle it on there and seal it. and then there's a collection every week and they take it, it they take it away and take it to the parks or and they, they yeah what they do in actual fact is they put it they use um, rockets which in actual fact aren't dissimilar to your green cones mm. um, but they accelerate the decomposition process and uh, and then they turn it into a fantastic friable compost that in turn gets distributed to various allotments and gardens and, and is for sale and they found that they're, they're able to create a product that they can sell. Oh, that's know. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's it, encourage other local authorities to do that. I mean, it seems that the sustainable development, it, I mean, it really is a, a sort of expression that's very much in the, in the public domain at the moment and for over, certainly over recent months for various reasons. And I was wondering, a person in your position, I was wondering how you thought that we can encourage as many people as possible to adopt the principles of sustainable development. I think personally at the moment it's just a phrase and nobody's living it. Right. Um, we're living in these very, very greedy consumerist times when people are buying more and more clothing and more and more gadgets and they're very, very cheap because they're designed in Europe, made in China or Vietnam or wherever. So we all trot off these phrases, sustainable development, but we'd have to change our way of life very considerably if we mean it. And I actually think people are getting sick of this greedy consumerist society. It's not making anyone happy. No, it's not. People, you know, work long hours. They never see the people they love. They never have time for, I don't know, their garden or just taking pleasure in making things or, I don't know, reflecting on things. And I think there's going to be a kind of sweeping change in society when people turn away from this consumerist, glitzy, shallow kind of way of living. And we go back to wanting to live more in community, know our neighbours more, be kinder to our families and friends. And people will get back to, I don't know, growing vegetables and going on the bus rather than having lots of cars and we've got to do it but it's going to be a big big change you know what I'm saying you can't just say I'm going to live exactly as I'm living now but I'll get some bakashi and then I can call myself sustainable I mean in many respects I think sustainable development is just all it is is just common sense and I think you're you're absolutely right here is Phil Welcome, Hi. Phil. And just to put you in the picture, listener, Richard has a big bandage which ties just on the top of his head and a little bow. <laughs> 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 ah. yeah. Now then, a couple of things that I've been wondering, just quickly. Anyway, we've got to get on to this magnet thing, haven't we? Yes, absolutely. This is from Jane Peroni. Hi, Heather. I'm still loving the weekly podcast, Stephanie Elmilka. I have a question I'm hoping you or Farmer Phil can answer. Well, there's no hope of me. It's a cow-related question that I feel somewhat silly asking. But I have to know whether it's true. 
Is there such a thing as a cow magnet? A magnet a few inches long that farmers put into cows' stomachs to prevent hardware disease, where cows become ill because metal objects they accidentally swallow, such as nails, damage their guts. I've read about it on the web, but as you know, the net isn't a totally reliable source of information. If cow magnets are real, my other question is, what stops the cow uh, passing the magnet before it does the job? Yours disbelievingly, Jane from The Guardian. And I've emailed Jane with my response to her question. But we need to know, is it well, true? Hardware disease, I think, must be an Americanism because in this country it's known as a cow having a wire. It originated from bits of fencing wire getting picked up in the machinery making hay or silage, the cow eating them, and the piece of wire goes down the gut and if it lodges in the intestine it will then slowly go through the side of the intestine and the cow will die of peritonitis. It gets an infection in the body cavity. So obviously something to be avoided and there are various ways of doing it and there are metal detectors on them. Just a minute, when the cow's chewing the grass doesn't he notice that, that there's some it can metal? Be a very tiny piece and no they don't necessarily notice and it's because the machinery might have chopped up a piece of wire that's left lying around the field into little pieces. There are, there are several ways around it. The forage harvesters that make silage have metal detectors on them so that you can pick them up at that point but then the machinery itself might be leaving fragments of metal from bearings or bits of machinery that fail that get into the food stuff. How likely is this? Not likely, but then if the piece of metal kills the cow, you've only got to do it once. Okay. You know, and you've, if you've got a highly valuable dairy cow or whatever, then it, it's... The idea is a cow's digestive system is made up of a series of stomachs. The first one is called the rumen, and the cow eats the food into the rumen where it partially digests it, then it regurgitates it and chews the cud, and then has another go. And so the inlet and the outlet of the rumen are both at the top of it. So if you put something heavy into it, it stays there. Small bits of wire and metal are not heavy enough so that they will go through it with the food, but a magnet will sit in the bottom of it quite happily, attracts any fragments of metal to it, and stops them doing any damage to the rest of its gut. And because the outlet of the rumen is at the top, it doesn't allow the magnet to get out. Wow. Isn't that and amazing? Sim similarly, <laughs> you so use um, slow-release... The Wiggly Wormcast podcast by Monty, a weekly fact on worms. In Australia, Aborigines use the oily fluid from worms to cure rheumatism. We're down by the banks of the Y. I've just driven Alison down here. She's been clinging onto the quad by, the, <laughs> by her fingernails. And uh, she, we did get halfway, and Alison said, well, "Have you been driven one of these before, Rich?" And I said, "No." <laughs> but we got here. We got here, and Alison showed me this amazing. There are two willows, and uh, they're absolutely plastered in what look like ermine moths. But I don't think they are ermine moths because they they seem too small, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they seem a lot smaller now that they some of them have hatched out. Haven't they? They, they have. And uh, what does it look like, Alison? There are all these tiny nests. Aren't well, there? there's these massive nests of like green caterpillars. But on the ends, because they're changing, they're, they're going black um, in a mass of cobwebs. But that one in the middle of the tree, look, it's, it's huge. This is huge, isn't it? I mean, it is absolutely massive. And what's interesting, there are all these... You see all these tiny little parasitic wasps? You see all these tiny little wasps, look, and they're trying to infiltrate oh, yeah. the nest. So whether they're trying to catch some live caterpillars or lay their eggs inside the, uh, inside the caterpillars. But in actual fact, if you look on the outside of the nest, there are tiny little casters, aren't there? Yeah, right. And I wonder whether that, those are the, the casters from these tiny little parasitic wasps. But this is often, obviously what But these are, are I mean, there are here. tens of thousands of them, aren't there? And they're micromoths of sorts. Little, they're probably, what are they, 15 mil long? 15 yeah. mil long, white with tiny little black spots. Fantastic little things. We'll have to find out what they are. I've, I've no idea what they are, just to look at, to say, but uh, I can certainly try and look them up tonight and find out what they are. But, yeah, I don't think I've ever, ever seen anything like this. Have you seen anything like this before? No, no, never like this. Yeah. And let, the whole trunk has got a huge cobweb surrounding the whole surface of it. It has. If you look at it. Oh, wow. It's yeah. all surrounded with cobwebs from top to bottom of that the tree. That is amazing. And, and how tall is this tree? Even, the, even from yeah. the trunk, look, right it, the way up. Every covered. little crevice has got these tiny, tiny caterpillars and moths all over it. Yeah. The whole trunk. 
<laughs> What's that? How many feet is that? It's got to be 25 foot, isn't it? Yeah. Easy. Yeah. 25 foot, and it's just completely encapsulated in a cobweb. That is incredible. No, I can safely say I've never seen anything like this before. Does Any it? good news from Lower Blakemere? Well, yes, really. We spoke a couple of weeks ago about our twins. Well, about three weeks later, we had another pair of twins. Yeah, wow. And given that I reckon that twins come along about 1% of the time, for the first two cattle to calve in the herd to both have healthy twins, I reckon is yeah, a fair turn up for the book. Isn't it? I don't think my maths is up to the statistics, but it doesn't happen very often. And uh, all four calves and their mothers are doing very well, so it's mm, great. Well, that's brilliant. The Wiggly Podcast. The archers, but real. Okay, Wiggly team, let's see if you can uh, solve the mystery of these uh, sounds we're getting late at night. This is the third night on the trot now that San and I have had these gawking sound outside our window. Typical, third night, Sandra's sound asleep, snoring away, you can probably hear her upstairs. I'm the one taking the wander outside just to see if we can record these sounds. So bear with me just a minute. It would be typical if I scare them off. Well, hopefully that's picked up enough. They seem to have moved away a little bit. I think they're bats. Sandra thinks they're owls. I think she's got a bit of inside information. But uh, if you can help us out, let us know. Bye. I feel it only fair, as Alex isn't here, that I should defend myself against this snoring issue. One, I'm sure I don't snore. Of course not. No. (laughs) But I was still awake. Really? Ever so slightly. And I did manage to hear him twittering about how they're on the apex of the roof and he can see them. Mm -hmm. So, not quite snoring yet. And to Mr Brittas from me, because Alex is, in actual fact, manager of the world's best leisure centre, (laughs) Hereford, I can only say to him, if only he'd taken more notice on the trip to Cornwall that he and I had last year, when I started off with my Jeff Sample CD and he went to sleep on Blackbird. Tweet, 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 tweet. Number five. Absolutely. And when he woke up, it was number 97, I think. Something like that. Yeah. And had he only listened, he would have heard Little Owl because what did I identify those screeches with? My Jeff Sample CD on iTunes. So, we think it's a Little Owl. We're not totally sure because Ricardo's not here. Hmm. But Quietly confident. We have used technology in the form of a mic and a phone and we've played it over to Jenny Steele. <laughs> <laughs> she said it could be a small tawny but it sounds much more like a little owl. Well, that noise you can hear in the background is the combine. I've just walked up the field and Farmer Bill is sat in his combine dust swirling around everywhere it's a steaming hot day and this is the noise that Herefordshire is full of at this time of year right through from the mid morning right through to last thing at night you can hear combine harvesters right the way across the county so anyway I'm going to climb up in this massive machine in front of me and have a word with Phil I've just clambered my way into this combine up a really steep staircase up into a huge cab and the, the natural fact this cab is a little nicer than the inside of my car <laughs> it's really cool it's not saying but no it's not saying a lot no, I, have to be, I have to be honest but it's, it's really smart there's a little computer screen above me that's uh, all down to climate control we've got a radio and uh, it's, it's all looking quite flush in here the Wiggly team Rach, Heather, Jodie and Sam have played tennis for the local sports club for 15 years. And we've just won Division 7 Hereford West. And we've gone up into the new league! 15 years of trying! And finally, we've won! Well, in a way, one of the things about the environment movement that I like is that a lot of members of it come across, you know, as having 
very uh, holy jumpers and open-toed sandals and eating nut cutlets right. and wringing their hands about the doom and gloom. I don't mind the doom and gloom so much because a bit of doom and gloom, I think, concentrates the mind most wonderfully. Yeah. You see, the way I look at it is if we trash the world, fine, that's great, trash it. We're supposed to be called homo sapiens. If we trash it, that is a living, living example of our arrogance we haven't called ourselves so wise. Right. That's absolutely right. I mean, I, I'm kind of inclined to think that um, the human species are a bit like algae in a pond. So you have, an, you have an algae bloom and it proliferates to such an extent that it's completely overpopulated the pond, uh, it depletes all the nutrients in the pond and suddenly it dies, it completely dies. Now that's obviously something that happens very, very quickly in the big scheme of things. But in many respects, the, the way human beings are going, we're replicating that situation but on a slightly slower scale. So we're killing ourselves by smoking as opposed to harakari or something you know that's that's that, that would be the that would be the analogy that i yeah well i mean i think if we kill ourselves it doesn't really it, it, in the scheme of things it doesn't actually matter i mean we have this wonderful arrogance that that humans are the end of the evolutionary life chain right and we're quite obviously not no um and we spend right. we, we spend most of our time questioning the meaning of life and worrying about there's no meaning of life and then artificially creating reasons for the meaning of life but I think that actually that urge to find a reason for living is actually the thing that will save us. Right. Because I think most people, whether they recognise it or not, have, don't call, let's not call it religious, because it's not, I don't mean it in a religious sense, but they have a spiritual need to belong, to be part of something. Yeah. And <laughs> I think the stories we need to tell for the future are about... Um, so that was a tractor going past. Um, uh, are about... Uh, about giving us meaning, about letting us understand that maybe we should, to be happy, live with the grain of nature. Right. And I think that is the great challenge for our civilization to prove whether it was worth having, is whether we can come out of the industrial age and exploiting resources. Very cleverly, I made mean, unbelievable leaps forward. But we've always believed that technology is going to... Any problem we create, we believe that we'll invent another technology. Yeah. When all the evidence is that each time a new technology is created to deal with the problem of the first technology the new technology has got another problem that another form of technology is then going to be needed to deal with. Right. And I think that the, 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 the end point of that is when we realise it's actually going to be about our lifestyles. Yeah. If you think about it, the great changes in human society, we talk about history, when you went to school, when I went to school, right, history begins with the, in Britain with the Romans, you know, because they wrote things down. It's your yeah, you've got the chapter in the beginning of the book yeah. about prehistory. Which is actually wonderfully arrogant, isn't it? Pre, yeah. That's prehistory, but history starts with the Romans, and then you get to the, you know, the, the Romans and the Anglo Saxons and so on, and you go through the Dark Ages, the whole thing right up to the present day. But actually, I would contend that every major transformation in Homo sapiens took place before history began. Everything that's happened since the Romans is actually of marginal significance. Right. Um, we were wildish creatures that discover caves and learn to paint and have imagery of ourselves in the Paleolithic. And in the Mesolithic, we develop a Bedouin lifestyle, we become much better hunters, our brains become more acute, and we then start to think about life after death and burying people and giving them funerary goods. Right. right? But we're now living on the land. We then have this period, the Neolithic, the Bronze Age, which is when you talk to most people, they talk about the dawning of civilization in the, in the, the Fertile Crescent in, uh, uh, you know, in Mesopotamia. And this fantastic idea that it was settlement that made us civilised. And every human you meet believes this to be true. Right. And yet with settlement, what you get is a, a, a massive increase of population, a massive controlling force of predominantly male power, controlling uh, increasing re groups of resource going out. Yep. And the theory goes that, oh, well, it's the surpluses created by that settlement that then enabled the arts to flourish and mathematics and science and the great flowering of what we call civilization yet civilization after civilization would collapse after that right and you've got to ask yourself whether the big question is was settlement what we were meant to do it's a really big question I mean, it's, you, you, it's, you know, no, it's not a question that uh, that anybody can answer no but but what do you think is happening to us 99 percent of all the time that homo sat's been on earth we've been hunter gatherers yeah and we're now in a very short period of time you know i think about postage stamp thickness on top of the empire state building Right. We're now so-called civilised and living the way we are now. What do you think that's doing to us? What do you think we're repressing? What do you think urges and desires are being completely messed up by the way we live? Now then, this brings me to rain gardening because we were asked last week about rain gardening. 
Could one use purple loose drive in one's rain garden? Yeah, you could certainly use it in a rain garden because it likes the boggy site, so when it rains, that's fine. But also because it's a native plant, should that site become dry, because, you know, we've hardly had any rain in Herefordshire at the moment, it is tolerant of um, the dry conditions, but as soon as it rains again, it'll, it'll perk up. So, yeah, it'd be ideal. We were talking about bees, because I've got a neighbour that offered me some hives. Right. And, and you said you should take, you take them up on the offer and get the hives. They're really expensive and it's relatively easy to get a, a swarm of bees. How, how long have you been beekeeping? Probably about four or five years now. And you, you obviously find it quite rewarding. Yes, I mean, it is very rewarding. It's good fun. You get a lot of honey and it's, it's really quite easy to do. Is it really quite easy to do? Because I imagine people, you know, most people have visions of big swarms of stinging insects hovering around their pride and joy and it's going to be sort of t- taking your life in your hands every time. It can be, it can be. And this is one of the problems that a lot of beekeepers have when they first start because a swarm quite often has a queen, obviously, that you don't know about its quality. And because the worker's temperament is dependent upon that of, of the queen, if you don't know what the queen's like, you don't really know what the swarm is going to be like. So it's much better, if you can, to try and start off with a queen that's bred and that you know is going to produce high-quality workers with a very calm temperament. And then you don't run into those problems, which are, I How think, probably... How do you do that, though? How do you vet the, the temperament of the queen? <laughs> well, it's best to get it from either somebody that you know who's been breeding queens or from a, a company that do breed queens. So okay. I've just done that myself. Right. My bees were getting a little bit uh, aggressive, so I requeened this year with two very calm queens and was looking at them yesterday and I really didn't need any equipment on at all. They were so calm. Really? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing stuff. Phil, I think you might be, you know, the soldier that's marching out of step because whilst you really like your hedges and you think that they are the best thing since sliced bread, everybody that knows what they're talking about, disagrees with your management strategy. Oh. Sweeping state oh. number one. Oh, what no, I mean, you, you know, might have to be a referee. English nature, nature, trust, leaf. You know anybody that's kind of thinking about conserving hedges for wildlife, also looking at, you know, conserving hedges for practical purposes, which you obviously do. I mean, I'm trying not to smirk and be slightly cocky over the whole hedge scenario, but... But... <laughs> But I'm wondering, if you didn't get into the next section of this competition, and if everybody, uh, every the organisations like English Nature and the Nature Trusts and LEAF and pretty much everyone that is aware of the significance of, of hedges and is also aware of the decline in lots and lots of invertebrates because of hedge management since the mid-1940s, <laughs> and yet you still think that your management strategy is the best, I'm just wondering how, other than through sheer <laughs> belligerence, you can come up to that conclusion. Uh, is that a uh, knockout blow, Phil? I feel that he's actually trying for a, a maul. Well, I just take the view that actual, he, you know, he has boxing. waited. He's waited some time for his diatribe, yeah. and there we have it. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that we didn't reach the final, I am guessing because I don't know that it is those people who have adopted the environmental scheme so they've got wide wildflower margins and things like that that go with the hedges, that they have effectively put more effort into the management of the hedge and its surrounding environment, I'm guessing. In conversation with the judge, Tony agreed with my management principles. He also agreed that the latest DEFRA rules had damaged the hedges. I think that, as always, and as I've always maintained, Rich, (laughs) that the management of hedgerows should be a compromise that fits with the effective farming of the ground. He's back. I do not agree with maintaining farmland. I don't don't see where the compromise is. The compromise is, Rich, that if farmland is going to produce food for you and I to eat, then it has to be farmed and that the environmental benefits of hedges and their environs have to fit in. Now, that conflict is going to be a balance. You can't have fields and fields of wildflower meadows and eat your loaf of bread every day. Wow, Rod. What do you think of that, old boy? That was interesting. (laughs) (laughs) A little scary, but... (laughs) Why were you running out of the door? Yes, I was was going to get my mum. (laughs) (laughs) Our flowers, we don't really claim that they last ages, but we do know what's been put on them and where they're from. 
but also people are going to get a longer vase life from your flowers because they don't have to come as far. They're not coming from Kenya. That's you true. Know? And so that cuts back on vase life. But a lot of what makes commercially grown cut flowers seem so unflower like they don't have a scent, all those things have more to do with breeding than how they're raised necessarily. Roses have all had the scent bred out of them because scent is very tied with ethylene production, which is the hormone that speeds ripening. So a flower is cut and it's going to die and it has to do everything in its power to try to get pollinated before it dies. So ethylene really accelerates all that. So by breeding flowers that don't have a scent, they'll last longer in the vase. Mm. It's a great environment here for many species. You know, you're probably talking about five or six species. And, and when you think, I say, we've got only about 16 species in the country. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty and great, Herefordshire yeah. is really brilliant for bats. And a lot of it's to do with how the land's managed. It's great to see the hedgerows at the trees. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, really, it really is. Yeah, you know, yeah. to, a, to a bat, the hedgerows are, yeah. are the rootways. <laughs> you know, I mean, there is, you know, are cases of sort of woodlands that are completely isolated and the bats yeah. don't come out. <coughs> they so don't like flying across the open space, or some species don't. But to say there are some bats, and you know, we might hear one later on if I switch this on, like flying out in the open. The big noctual bats, mm. like 12, 14 inch wingspan, they like it out in the open. They're not frightened, and they're, they're probably the ones that you find roosting in the, tr- in the old trees. They get behind the bark, they get in behind the cracks and the rotten bits where the branches are broken down. You know, they don't need much room, just a couple of millimetres. I thought I saw a bat then. That did look like a bat, didn't it? It did, didn't it? Oh, there's one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's turn this on and see what we've got, shall we? I've got the detector tuned at around about 50. I say that's a, a typical sort of um, frequency to start on because you're typically going to pick up pipistrels. How close did I have to come? The pipistrels you'd pick up probably about like that. Oh. Yeah, that one. The thing is now to yeah. see it. <laughs> yeah. And once you pick up one, if he's, if he's there long enough, you can tune up and down to see if he's a 55 or a 45. And this one, and this one's a nice 45 pipistrelle, so that's a common pipistrelle. And if you listen very carefully, did you hear that little thing? That like I said, like you're blowing a raspberry. Mm-hmm. That's their feeding buzz. As they locate something, a small insect, they'll increase the rate of the pulses. And they hone in on it, the insect, and eat it, basically. And these will be picking up midges and little mosquitoes. They won't be eating the moths. Mm. Typically, th- 3,000 midges a night per bat. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah, so if you don't yeah. like midges and mosquitoes like it's most of us... It's an ideal animal to have in your garden. That's definitely. right. We've got a director. Mary just counted us in for the podcast number 49. Thank you, Mary. We've never been counted in before. 48. 48? Mary just counted us in. Oh, so good. Right, start again. <laughs> I won't do it again. No. Come in close, Phil. <laughs> Dear listener, it's number 49 podcast and Still this... Still 48. Oh, <laughs> it was right. 48 a minute Sorry. ago. <laughs> Dear listener, it's podcast number... 48. Not 49, it's... 48. That's definitely right. But we're here today, and you can probably hear the difference in the sound. We're not sat on the wiggly sofa. We're in Office Wiggly. The Wiggly Podcast. Let your iPod bloom. just had an address from the mayor of the island that we're on and uh, Professor Higa was stood next to him. You've heard the Austrian horn, something a beast about 12 foot long the guy was playing then but this is a fantastic setting 
I'm gazing out across Lake Shemsey, just at the foothills of the Austrian Alps, in actual fact, and I gaze across this clear lake, fish dappling the surface, and there's a whole throng of people behind me, but I couldn't imagine a more superb setting for a conference. So uh, hopefully the, the talks that we'll listen to today will be as interesting as the scenery is inspiring. Hello, Professor Isamani. Hello. Um, I, I, wanted, I was completely inspired by your talk. It's probably, for me, it was one of the most passionate, heartfelt speeches of this seminar so far by, by a long chalk. Um, the, the material you talked about was predominantly about treating uh, patients with cancer, especially breast cancer, with yes, EM. That is my passion, my research, a whole long lifetime. Right. And you, where, do, where do you practice? I am a surgeon by profession. I did my fellowship from London and MD from the States and then I went back home and worked as a head of department of surgery for 25 years right. and also principal of the medical school for six years. Right. Now I'm doing only research for the last five years on breast cancer but I have 28 years behind me of only research on breast diseases okay. and cancer which is very common as I said. Yeah, 35% absolutely. of all cancers. Right. And how did you discover EM originally? Well, I was treating a lot of breast cancer and the person who was using it was one doctor who was from the agriculture side. Right. He is a friend and he once came and said that Professor Higa from Japan was visiting and if I would like to meet him, I said certainly it would be a pleasure. So he brought him along to my breast cancer clinic. I run a clinic there five days a week. Right. And there we get three to five new cancer patients every day. Right. And we used to get sometimes as much as seven or eight, which was a very, very high incidence. Right. And so Professor Higa mentioned, and I thought anything I would add to the treatment modalities which are used all over the world. Yeah. So I added the CMX in 97, and I found fantastic results. We were giving them from day one. And their vitality, as I showed you, their work status, their quality of life was better. They were living longer. The spread did not occur as in other women because we had control for all the groups. And after giving the standard treatment, if they developed secondaries, we gave them the CMX. And the disease became static somehow. Right. So I found it extremely useful. Quality of life was much better. It's astonishing, isn't it? I mean, it are is. you truly amazed by the, the I am way it amazed, works? and that's why today I recommend Professor Higa, who is the creator of EM technology. Again, I was showing that it's environmental, water pollution, food pollution, and all the dirt and dust around us. EM technology is used for that. Right. And yeah. also EMX for human consumption. Right. So he should be nominated for a Nobel Prize because he's the creator of all this. But nobody seems to think about it. Well, it's incredible, you know. I mean, it's certainly in England, there are so few people have heard of EM even, let alone realise the extent to which it can be used in treatment. So yes, it should be used. I would say any time it should be used. It increases the immunity of the body, the immune cells. They increase their immune modulation. And that's why I think it should be used more and more. And I'm recommending it because I have seen the results yeah. for 10 years at least. And the women are living, working normally. Some are engineers, some are professors in the medical schools, bankers, and in different classes of society, even housewives. Housewife is a full-time job. Right. So it's quite an undertaking for a woman who has had breast cancer. Absolutely. They are doing so well for 10 years, 15 years. So I'm really, yeah. I'm really impressed. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time. And it's a pleasure to meet you. Welcome. And the last one on the US iTunes site. Funny and bright, five stars. I love this cast. Brilliant. Well produced. Thank you, Michael. Hilarious and smart. Trust me, you will love this cast too. Hope you do. It's over to Monty. The Wiggly Worm Cash Podcast by Monty. A weekly fact on slow worms. Slow worms are the most commonly seen reptile in Britain. Adults have a smooth, shiny appearance and a grey or bluish belly.
Hello, listener, and welcome to the Wiggly Podcast number 54. Can you believe it? 54, Rach? No, I know. It's amazing, isn't it? Never thought you'd make it this far. No. <laughs> You've done a few cameos recently, haven't you? I am, yeah. It's a cameo with you today, which is unusual. It, well, yeah, it's nice as well. I must admit, you've got some nice blue eyeliner on as well today. Thanks, Rich. Is that for my no. benefit? Or? I, no, I really, it's matching the blue that's on your cast, that's on your arm, <laughs> on arm, your broken yeah. arm. So, <laughs> so there well, we I sh- are. Well, I should say to the listeners that we've lost Heather and Phil this week because they've gone across the other side of the pond to look for all things Elvis-like, haven't they? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> So things are going great, Guns, and Heather did send us a whole list of stuff to, to talk about today, but I think what we'll do with that is just, Heather, you've just got to learn to let go sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, without further ado, we've got lots of things to talk about, so let's crack on. Right now, go. Well, where's the music, Rich? Of course, yeah, Heather's not here, so of course she's the one who usually plays the music. What do we do, Rach? Um, well, I can give it a go if you like. Go on, go for it. Ready? Yep. (laughs) That's it, Rich. That was absolutely brilliant, Rach. (laughs) Completely (laughs) inspired. Mm. 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 Oh, I have. That's a great present. Mm. That's really tasty honey. And it's so good to share gifts. Isn't it is. it? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Mm. No, it's a I, good. Uh, at least you've I'll tell you what, Ed, if you'd grab it back, he'd never catch you on those crutches. <laughs> 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 yeah. Right. You could either you could put them on the top shelf in the in the pantry. I'd never be able to reach. So, what do we think of Actually, no, Weber on the top shelf in the pantry. honey from the fields of Tennessee? Some say it's the best honey around. Where's our Southern saying book? That's the other thing I listened. You know when I listened to the podcast, you were sort of taking off these, these different American expressions, mm. trying to sort of impersonate mm. someone from the deep south. Yeah. I, I don't think you should do it. <laughs> We've got a phrase book. What do you mean? I'm excited as a bug in a tater pad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's quite good. It's improved. I've practised. <laughs> practised and makes players say that phrase. They know I don't mean any harm. No. <laughs> No, no. Don't you? <laughs> no, it's not harmful to them. It's just harmful to the listener. <laughs> oh, let's see. And you instigated Rach's piano playing, and you're saying this, Rich. No, no, I can't take credit for that. That was that was Michael that instigated Rach's piano playing. That was Michael's little brainchild. I must say, you got a face like a toe sack of turnips. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. I'm going to have to hide that book. Yeah, I, I love that book. <laughs> Hey, Wiggly Wigglers, this is NCM from the No Credit Needed Podcast. Um, I live in the America, in, <laughs> in Georgia, and I have a true southern accent. So if you ever need any help with your southern sayings, just give me a holler, and uh, <laughs> I'll help you out. I'll help y'all out. How about that? I really love what you guys do. It's awesome. I love the accent. I love the information. Uh, and I'm just, whenever I, I just picture your place in my mind, and I, I don't know exactly how it looks, but I can just picture it, and, uh, and I just know it's got to be a wonderful place. But you guys are doing an awesome job. Congrats on all the awards that you've received. They're well-deserved, and I love the banter back and forth. <laughs> it's just awesome. It's really good. Well, well, y'all have a blessed day and a Merry Christmas and all that kind of good stuff and a Happy New Year. Talk to you later. This is NCN. Bye-bye. What do you think of that, Rich? I thought that was superb. Now, you are going to love this guy, because he's NCN. All right. 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 On we go, because this week it's the Wiggly Cloudcast. I'm just walking up the field to meet Farmer Phil, who's coming towards me with his John Deere tractor and plough. He's ploughing diagonally, actually, so I'll ask him why that is. And I'm in a field called the Lawns, which I'll also ask him about. I'm actually walking up on the most glorious autumnal day, and I'm walking towards Tiberton, to a place that was called Tiberton Court. 
But anyway, I'm just about to get there. The scrunching that you can hear is me walking on the stubble. This was a crop of wheat which has been combined and years ago they used to burn the stubble but now that's not the ticket so it's being ploughed in. You can probably just start to hear the tractor in the distance. So he's just coming towards me now. The one set of wheels are in the furrow, so he's sort of lopsided and he's heading up the field and he's just doing a corner at the moment, so there'll be a fairly short run and he'll stop and then I can get on board and find out all about it. Watch this space, listener. This is the chance to find out about ploughing. Rock on! So, we've all got to be a bit quiet today because the cat's asleep. Noah on Rachel's lap. If we make a lot of noise, do you think it'll dig his pins into Rach and then we'd have a laugh? <laughs> it's I quite a vicious not. cat, Noah. Yeah. You only have to touch it in the wrong place, Rach. Yeah. Like there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very selective cat and I have been selected for him to sit on my lap. You're so honoured. Very honoured, yeah. Noah. Thank you. And you, you wore your wiggly t-shirt in Tennessee, didn't you, Phil? I did. Wow. Very trendy. Right? Absolutely. Those boys in Hereford, they say they're most trendy. They love them. But someone I know didn't like them at all. Here's Anita Roddick with the Wiggly Wigglers' worst product. Oh, dear. Oh. Anita, there's yeah. one product you, you're not so keen on in our catalogue. I know you like loads of them. I like lots of the stuff you do, but I have to say, you've fallen mightily <laughs> down on your branding of your T-shirts. They remind me of these sort of, like, sacks. <laughs> you know, anybody wearing them, you know, they are so... Un not that you want to be sexy, but at least you want to have... You want to say something. I mean, they are, they are quite pathetic. I mean, did you... <laughs> It's not funny, it's no. terrible actually, Sorry. it's terrible. Yeah. I mean, you'd be very serious about this because yes. you've taken over a good space <laughs> on this one. I mean, not only have you got the shittiest looking colour yes. for a t-shirt, mm. but <laughs> you're wiggly worms for Britain. I mean, where does that, where does <laughs> that come from? They are organic. That's great, that's good. Can you feed them to the, to the, to the, to the, to the worms? Will they? I'll, I'll recycle them straight yeah, away. Yes. And for all you young folk in Hereford, out in the club in our T-shirt, Anita says you're it, not cool. It's just not, it's just... Any, any great graphic that goes on the front in terms of where women's breasts are aren't going to work. <laughs> so just, Cut. it's cool to put on the back or something. Got anyway, it. Anyway, thank right, you. Take care. That's his first bit of feedback, and then there's a second story, right. which is to us. Hi, Wiggly Podcast team. While listening to Podcast 58, I was really interested in how Bokashi keeps rats and mice away, and I wondered whether it would keep the neighbours' BTBs away. Huh. It's another BTBs. one of those. Yeah. Another yeah. One, yeah. Do you know what that is standing for? Uh, bloody <laughs> Tom Baker. <laughs> Uh, no, BTV. No, no, Phil. Big troublesome boys. It's good. <laughs> Big troublesome boys. <laughs> no, uh, it's it's. This is ridiculous, but it's bird torturing bur. Ah, ah, <laughs> excellent. No. And um, pussy cats. No, no, excellent. Oh, another man after one. <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd like that. Yeah. He wondered if it would keep the neighbours bird torturing bur. Away, if I place it under the bird table. I was a little disheartened when Richard mentioned that his dogs dug it up. But if you could find an animal-friendly way of keeping cats out of the gardens and off the borders, you realise that you will become very 
very rich. Oh, absolutely. Cheers, Simon. Yeah, he's completely right. We've talked no, about this before. No, he's not right. We? We've talked about this before. He is. Uh, <laughs> cats are a nightmare, and they really are. You know, you just have this pet that you consider to be perfectly reasonable to let out, and then go and in someone's garden, kill their birds. I mean, you know, it's astonishingly grim, really. And especially, you know, in our society, we're all getting closer and closer together. I wouldn't let my dog go run around my neighbour's garden and kill everything in sight. You just don't do it, do you? But it's perfectly reasonable for an owner to let a cat do it. Right. Because it's not, is it? It's not. So, yeah, but no, I mean... I, I... No, no, <laughs> well, just stop. I think there's a bit of a no. rant going on. Is it? Now, I was thinking, dear listener that you should share the Wiggly podcast with someone else. So, would you mind emailing your buddy and telling him about it or her about it? That would be fab. And in the meantime, over to Monty for his weekly Wormcast. The Wiggly Wormcast podcast by Monty. A weekly fact on worms. Charles Darwin found that his number of earthworms could bury a football patch in 15 tonnes of soil a year from the casts that leave on the surface. Thanks a lot for that, Mum. And this week at Wiggly Wigglers comes to an end. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Of course, they, they won't let you leave hospital unless you have a bowel movement because they don't want you to, you know, they don't want your spleen to split or rupture or something like that. So, so of course, they said, well, you know, you can leave, but we can't discharge you unless you've had a proper bowel movement. And uh, so I thought, oh, gosh, you know, I really want to lean, leave with a clean slate. I don't, want to, I don't want to discharge myself. So lots of oranges, lots of apples. Uh, loads of water, nothing. No, bit of, you know, a bit of remote grumbling. And this has been, this is a week now. You know, I haven't been, oh, I haven't right. leave for a week. You know, they were obviously conscious that there was quite a build up. <laughs> so I thought, oh God. So anyway, this, I said, well, the options are what can I do? So, well, you can take, you do some suppositories. So I said, okay, well, we'll give that a go. So the nurse came in and said, would you like to do this yourself or, or should I do it? And I said, oh, well, I can probably manage to do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's really it's quite it's quite an uncomfortable experience. They, the the uh, and the funny thing about those suppositories is they are shaped like a bullet, and you imagine that you know that the the, the 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 pointed end would be the one you insert first, yeah. but in actual fact, no, it's oh. the blunt end that goes in first. Oh my oh. god! So anyway, lots of funny games trying to do that. Of course, it didn't work, did it? It was only a little a little bit of bit of my bowel that that, that kind of crept out, so that oh. didn't didn't work, and then. I had to have the next step was a, a, an enema, which, oh. <laughs> which had to be administered by one of the nurses. So there I was, arse bed to the world. <laughs> In comes the male nurse. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I so, saw, oh God, the, the indignity of it all. So I laid on my bed and, uh, and he did what he had to do. And so that was it. I had to wait. Then he said, oh, if you can wait for 20 minutes or so. So I waited 20 minutes, 20 minutes went, three quarters of an hour went, a couple of hours went nothing no <laughs> movement at all so this was friday night and i really wanted to go i was so desperate to come home you know i've been in that place for all that time i wanted to come home but no so I thought, oh god well i might as well stay here tonight no friday night so i stayed there another night in hospital and in the morning saturday morning sarah bought some some concentrated organic prune juice good girl that, that had worked for her in the past <laughs> i had a couple of glugs of that stuff three more oranges and anyway, you can feel that things were starting to move a bit. Anyway, I managed to go to the loo. And you know what? I, I've never been so 
ecstatic, almost <laughs> euphoric from being able to go to the loo. Anyway, managed to go, and I was, I had my friend, and it was funny because when I, when I, when I told the nurse, I said, "Look, I've been to the loo, I've been to the loo, I've left it in there for you to see because I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that they could." They uh, they knew what the what the situation was. I didn't want them to think that you know they that, that I was making things up. And uh, he, he said, um, "I said, oh well, that's that's fine anyway." But when he walked back down to the end of the, the hospital ward, you could hear this. Well, <laughs> <laughs> they'd obviously been discussing the fact this poor fellow in, in room forty-one or whatever couldn't go to the loo and had to stay in hospital and on that basis. <laughs>